Gazina. Yes, Jeffrey. Did you hear the one about the two slices of bread? No, I did not. Well, there were these two slices of bread, and they were just sitting around early one morning having a nice, easygoing chat. Yes. And then all of a sudden, over by the breakfast table, there's this big commotion, mm -hmm. and one of the slices looks with complete alarm and says, oh, no. And the other slice says, what's the matter? Look there. Look there. What? I don't see anything. Don't you see the butter and the jam? So what? Don't you know what that means? No, what does it mean? We're toast! It's a true story. Hi. Hi! I have a question for you. Ask away. This is our 11th week. Yes. So for 10 weeks, we've been saying hello and goodbye yeah. with my right foot and your left foot. Correct. So why are we now changing left and right? What's going on here? Because you are on the pastry side. I'm on the yeasty beastie side. I have to make a pastry? You have to make a pastry. You're going to use yeast? I'm going to use yeast. Oh my gosh. Ooh. Well, there are times that you didn't use yeast. You did pasta. That's right. You did do pasta. Um, and I did do no donuts. So, but this is, we decided to switch it up and make it really interesting. Yeah. So what are you going to make? I'm going to make something called Svechkin Dachi. And what are you going to make? I'm going to make checkerboard sable cookies. That are beautiful. They are so beautiful. I saw your dough walking into the fridge. Oh. It's a good looking hmm. cookie. It's a really good looking cookie. So I'll start on the east side. And we'll do, what I also like about today is that it's got patterns and it's got color. Yeah. Everything has kind of got, got, got and this is all sweet. So this is a sweet cake. This is not a bread, this is a cake. And Svechkindachi, in this case, is a bit of a misnomer. I actually had a conversation with my Bavarian family, and I had to say, Servus, Tante Christel, Barbara, hello. So I wrote that, I wrote, wrote my little cousin Barbara, and I said, listen, if you're using round plums for this, is it still called Svechkindachi? And she said, no. Round plums are Pflaumen. Mm -hmm. And the oval ones that you can only get in September, August are Tsvechkin, which are the Italian plums. Um, and then so the next question was, so then if you use traditional round plums, is it then a dachi? And she said, and it was like this philosophical conundrum. Yeah. What's the translation of dachi? Well, it is, it is unclear. It could mean either press or pinch. Uh -huh. So that's how you put the plums uh -huh. into the dough. Mm -hmm. But either way, Italian plums aren't available right now, but it is my favorite summer treat. And if you look at the links, you can go to a story about the history, my family's history with this, because I'm not gonna go into, into it here because I don't want to start weeping, because it, it will make me start crying. So I'm not gonna be weeping right now. So later, go there, and also the dough mix is right there. Just click the link for the dough mix because it takes a while. It's an enriched dough, which needs a little time and care. And if you look over here, I made the yeasted dough that I'm using, but I had, uh, I got my hands on a ton of apricots. So this would officially be called an Aprikosenkuchen, an apricot cake. But it's yeasted, it's got all the elements that what I'm making with the plums. But so this is so you can see, there I am making the mix. So hmm. go there for the mix. Um, I love how there's some dark bits that got a little singed around the perimeter. Just a little, oh, the, those yeah. little, that yeah. sugar on the apricots. Um, so we'll start with regular plums. So if, if we're going to be technical, this will be considered a Pflaumenkuchen. But know that when deep summer arrives, August, September, look for Tsvechkin. Those are those beautiful, almost black oval Italian plums. This is, that is what is traditionally used for this cake. So if you were to look at the mix, that will show you how to make the dough. And this is the dough itself. And I just rolled it and pulled it to about 15 by 10 inches. And then I let this covered rise for about an hour. Once it has had that rise, I'm going to now press the plums, I'm hearing beeping, into the dough. But first, we want to sweeten it up a little. I have, these are cookie crumbs. So traditionally, mm. in German baking, 
you would use sponge cake crumbs. And this is one of the things I love about German baking is that nothing goes to waste. Mm -hmm. So like in my strudel filling, if I've had a dome of vanilla cake, I will keep that. Mm -hmm. I will toast it off and yeah. make crumbs like bread crumbs. You probably don't do that regularly. So what I did instead is I swapped it out for like a, just a vanilla cookie. There's like social biscuits, whatever they're mm -hmm. called. I just grind them up in the food processor. And those crumbs will absorb some of the moisture that That's the fruit That's exactly absorbs. right. So it does a so couple things. It brings sweetness to mm -hmm. it. Uh, and almost a little crispiness, and it absorbs any juices that tend That would to otherwise flow out. go into the dough. Exactly. Yeah. However, you do want some of that yeah. juice to mm -hmm. color the dough, mm -hmm. because when you slice into it, one of the beauties of it is that you can see the cradle of purple mm -hmm. that just makes my heart sing. So the, what we did at home, when you would go to the bakery, you would get hefeteig, which means yeasted dough. At home in Virginia, when my mom could get her paws, which was Rarely, but when she did, she would clear out the grocery store, Safeway in Arlington, uh, of all their Italian plums, and she would make what's called a mervateig, which is a sweet dough, um, and I love that too. They're equally delicious. The mervateig is just a little simpler and faster because you don't have to do all the furious mixing. You and don't it's have to, richer too, though. It isn't is it? richer. Yeah. It's a lot of butter. Yeah. It's it is a little sweeter, but the lovely thing about this is that you get sweetness added in from those either cake crumbs or the cookie crumbs. And then you get it from, I'm gonna put sugar on top of the plums and I'm gonna make a strudel for the top of it. So you get that sweetness in this mm. too. Because really Italian plums have a lovely tartness to them. Yeah. And they're just really special. Now you'll notice here that I cut these plums and I really, I bought all the black plums in, north, in the north, <laughs> really. I mean, you can't go from New York to Maine and find a black plum now. So this is called a flaume. These are all flaumen, meaning plum in German. If it were the oval one, it would be a zwetschgen. So I just don't want to be in trouble with my family for saying the wrong thing. So what I did is I got the large ones that I could find. I got the smaller ones that I could find. And what I'm doing now is literally pressing the pieces. And I cut them up depending on whether they were the big plums or the small plums so that they would create a pattern in there and fit decently. The other thing that's important is that you get a lot of fruit. So traditionally, it'd be about four pounds of fruit for one cake. Mm. That's a lot of fruit. When I do the flaumen or the regular plum, I just cut them in half. And then, obviously, you take out the pit. When I do the zwetschgen, which are the oval ones, I don't cut them entirely in half. I leave a hinge on there, mm -hmm. so they're open like a book, and then I cut a little bit right here to open them up when they bake. So here we go with my four, one. I think it's listening. What's it doing? The camera's having a, a fun time. See, I created an interesting pattern, and you do not have to do this. This is just based on the types of plums that were available. You can see how different they look. Some of the flesh is kind of that green, and some of it is very red. And the ones that are very red are quite big. What I would also recommend when you get your paws on the fruit is to make sure that it isn't too soft because that will make cutting them open and pitting them virtually impossible. You will just be juicing those plums. So other than plums and apricots, are there other f stone fruits that would be used in Germany with a hefeteig? Um, well, I'm sure there is an Omi out there who uses cherries Sure. when they're out and about. Or peaches too juicy? Or peaches, I think, would be too juicy. And uh, quite honestly, the, uh, a nectarine would be another option as mm. well. I really think that it's such a seasonal dessert that if it's in season, I say, and if it doesn't juice out too much, go ahead and use it. And so this is, I love to create patterns, even if you have disparate types of fruit, but really the point is that you pack them in side by side, and this is the dachi part, even though this isn't officially a dachi because they're not the oval ones. You have to press in the fruit. So it's almost like you're doing a punch down with a dough, right? Mm -hmm. By pressing down with the plums. And I actually think this is quite lovely because you get the two different sizes and the color variation is nice. 
I actually had more plums than I needed, which is shocking. So there we go. Plummy. They're very plummy. So I have five of the smaller ones have side by side, and I can only fit four of the larger ones. And then before I cover this up, I actually am going to essentially macerate them a little bit with the cinnamon and sugar mm -hmm. so that they do juice out a little mm -hmm. bit. So that creates also a little glue for the strudel when yeah. it goes on. But it, because oftentimes, especially these black plums, when you see the skin looks a little dry, you do want them to juice out because they dry out pretty quickly mm -hmm. in the oven. And the sugar will draw juice out. They'll just, it? so you'll, ma since it's like macerating when, uh, strawberries when you want them to be nice and juicy, mm -hmm. we're going to be sweetening this up and getting some of that juice out. Um, what's also pretty traditional when you are finished baking, when you have exposed fruit, you would put some uh, apricot jam on top of the fruit to make it shiny and mm -hmm. sweeter. Mm -hmm. And but it'll I, preserve it a little. And it'll preserve it, it as well. But I'm going to be putting so much of uh, the, the strudel on top <laughs> that there won't be any room <laughs> to put lovely apricot jam on top. So now I'm just going to cover this and let this rest for about 20 minutes and then it's on to you, sir. Okay, so you're not making your strudel now? After. Okay. After you're done I will with your get cookies. my stuff out of here. So, if you're looking at this recipe, you just click on the links that are in the description. So there's a Svechkin Dachi, one for the whole recipe that gives you the recipe for the dough, for the strudel, for what else? Just all the other fixings that go on top of that. There's also the link that shows you how to make the dough. That's a separate video because it takes about Ooh, about 15, 20 minutes. So we figured we'll do a separate video so you're not sitting here staring at a mixer for 15 minutes. Now, technically, this is called a Pflaumenkuchen because we are using the round plums. Svechkandachi, which is Bavarian. It's a, like a different language. So instead of like, ich heiße Gesine, my name is Gesine, that would be German. Ich was Gesine would be Bavarian. Different languages. So only in Bavaria would they call it a Svechkin. But in northern Germany, they would probably call the ovals just Pflaumen and then maybe Italianish, Italian plums. Oh my gosh, the world, language, it's amazing. Also, again, Servus Favara, Servus Tante Thank you for giving me all the information about the plums that I ever needed and I wanted. So now Jeffrey has his gorgeous dough, and we're going to do this backwards. So he's going to cut his assembled dough so you can see what it looks like and how thin he cuts it and then and you're then going, going to, to assemble and then you're going to assemble already made dough already and made dough. last but not least after He's a while cool. i'll mix it dough. you'll mix it so jeffrey those are art those are beautiful so these are checkerboard sablés they're fun to make they're a little bit challenging but in a kind of fun way uh, and they're pretty to look at when they come out of the oven and this would be the scrap dough that's lightly kneaded together to make a marbleized one. And we'll see all of these being made after a while, but we'll start with the cutting. I like to cut these with a really fine paring knife. And... Do you use a ruler when you... Um, I eyeball it when I do this part. Okay. I'll use a ruler when I go to the... Um, fashioning of the dough. Right. And it's important, isn't it, that it's nice and cool when you do this? Yeah, this dough is just now brought out from refrigeration. These keep very nicely, so it's worth making a whole batch. And if you like the flavor of these, but you find it's a little bit too challenging to make the checkerboard, first thing you can do is commit to the challenge. <laughs> Second thing you can do is say, no, I think instead I will just make the dark dough and the light dough and then make the whole thing marbleized. That would be pretty simple. It just, you know, even when it's not as perfect as yours, it's still striking and beautiful. It still looks good. Yeah, it looks good. Those look those look and it is good. fun. I mean, to have a baking challenge, I think probably most people watching our programs enjoy baking challenges, yes. right? One thing I should point out is that you'll see 
some areas that are kind of white in here and here. That's butter that wasn't completely creamed. It won't be visible after the bake. If now, we had big blotches of that, that might impair the visuals yeah. of it, but this is pretty minor. But speaking of what kind of butter did you use? Did you use a high Unsalted fat? Unsalted only. Unsalted but, but Amer Unsalted but American lower fat or higher I, fat? I always opt for high fat if I can get it. But I, if, if I couldn't get it, I would just make it with, with lower fat. Yes. Let's see. And now here's the marbleized ones. And the marbleized ones are from the trimmings yep, of when you are doing. the trimmings. That's all. So instead of, so oftentimes people will just knead everything together. Yeah, you can do that as an option. Yeah, but this is so great. The, mar the marbleization is just as beautiful, I think, as a checkerboard. I do too. You'll want to make sure that your knife is nice and vertical, so you don't, that's an exaggeration, but try really hard not to have it angled to one side or you'll have different dimensions. It's harder than you think. Yeah, it really is. I am a notorious uh, angle cutter. And there's nothing wrong if it's easier to, instead of eyeballing it like I'm doing, there's nothing wrong with scoring things with a ruler. Right so that you're really sure that everything's the same size. So I think these will go here. I have seen people also using dental floss to, to cut. cut cookies like this, yeah. And it huh. works well because what, especially with a round, um, it stops you from doing the angle because you um, draw the pieces together. And for some people it's just easier to do than, than cutting with a sharp knife. Huh. Use, use that. <laughs> For efficiency Neither sake, used right. nor yes, mint flavored. Always waxed. Okay, so here's our cookies. Let's see, there's no convection in the oven, right? So I don't need to have no. cookies here? No, it should be fine. Okay, good. All right, I will put these in. Maybe we'll go for 12 minutes. I'm assuming these will take 14 or 15 minutes, so I'll set a timer for 12 minutes. And this oven runs high, so this is at 350. So just, you will know your oven because they're all liars. So your oven might be better at 360 for this, but this one runs hot, so it's at 350. And whoa. How, is, how even is it left to right? Oh, it gets darker on the right side, I believe. So why don't I go eight minutes and then we can turn the trays around. Yeah. Better? Right. Yeah, I'm gonna do this again because sometimes it ignores you when you do that. There we go. Okay, now I'll go get the dough and we'll, I'll show you how I assembled the doughs from um, cold dough into the checkerboard, so. This is the fun part. This is the part that can be very um, confusing. So even when you read the directions, you'll go, huh, what? It's great to see this because it like, it brings some understanding to the written direction. This is where visual is so important where things like this can get a little confusing in the written recipe. And what kind of cocoa did you use for this? What kind of what? Cocoa. Uh, alkalized cocoa. I think it was, no need to name brands. There's plenty of good brands out there. Um, now, obviously you can make these any size you want. I like small cookies. I'm really, really fond of cookies in general, well-made cookies. And I like these very much because they're not particularly sweet. In order to ensure that you have reasonably even and square cookies, one thing that can be very helpful is to have some kind of a guide so that you're rolling these to the exact same dimension. So you can buy different guides or you can do like I did, which is say, well, I can just cut a couple of slats of wood. These are 3 eighths of an inch thick. So if I'm going to have four layers, that's going to mean an inch and a half high and hopefully an inch and a half square. So this to me is a really important tool. Gazina, can yep. I trouble you for some flour, please? Uh, yes, of course. Bench flour? Yeah. So I'm going to spin a bowl. Thank you. Thank you. And here's how we do it. Flour the bench. Flour the dough. 
and then This dough is cold. I made it yesterday. You could make it certainly two or three days, probably four or five days before you're going to assemble it. So those initial poundings with the pin, that's pretty much just to wake the dough up. Well, it also it helps it from cracking. Yeah, exactly. So now I'll put this here. You look pretty spot on right already. Any tricks for if you have gotten too thin? If too you got soon. too thin too soon, you can literally press it back into shape and make it a little bit too big so you can pin it down. Okay, so this is three eighths of an inch reliably. So excess flour comes off. The dough is still good and cold, which is important. We'll leave it there on the nice cold marble. And now we'll do the chocolate one in the same way. So a little flour, a little flour, a little flour. is just glorious. So when Jeffrey said alkalize, look for dutched cocoa. Um, that's usually what it'll say on the packaging. Yeah. And now, you know, the world has changed uh, for buying ingredients in such a lovely way that you can usually get a nice quality cocoa and chocolate at grocery stores. And that used not to be the case. That's right. So you'll notice this is far from geometrically perfect. That doesn't bother me because whatever trimmings I have to make it geometrically square or rectangular, the trimmings are all going to be used. In fact, I kind of like when I have a fair amount of trimming because it gives me a sufficient number of marbleized cookies. All right, now we have our two doughs. And again, three-eighths of an inch thick. That's what, I mean, you could do half inch and have a two-inch cookie. Yeah. But I, I like the smallest I like, ones. I like it. That this way you can eat three. <laughs> okay. Now I have some egg white that I just whipped up with a few drops of water. And... And this is your glue? This will be glue. So you want to be thin but thorough so that everything's covered. Otherwise, you'll have some separation of your cookies. So there's that. Then I'll lay this over. Did you sieve the whites at all before you? Uh, no, I just whipped them well. OK. That's and now I'm going to lightly pin this together. But be careful you don't go too strongly, because if you do, what will happen is you'll make this thinner. And, and so you'll wind right. up with rectangular cookies, not square cookies. OK? Now I'm going to cut this in half. That looks about half, so I'll score. Feel free cut. to use a ruler. <laughs> Feel free to use a ruler. And now... I'll turn them around. Thank you. Now I'll take and lay them like this. So there's my four layers. Bring this seam so it's nice and even. Again, lightly pin it. OK? And now I'll cut this to make it more of a reliable rectangle. And these are your marble scraps. Yep. Now, if I go into here, I'm going to create a lot. So I'll just go to here so that I won't create quite as much. And I'll have that little blip over there. But that's not going to be a big deal, as you'll see when we get to the assembly portion. 
And having a knife that's long enough is all. Yes. Also important. And deep enough too. Yeah. Okay. And here's another thing. Having the stove cold, you can also see as you're cutting it, is important because as you are cutting it, if it is not cold, it will start It'll mush. mushing the yeah. dough together and yeah. it won't have that wonderful, yeah. perfectly um, sized little squares. So this is the trimmings from before I baked when I cut the logs that are in the oven now. There's no reason to throw those out, so they'll just be born again as more of the marbleized dough. Now what I'm going to do is, now I do use a ruler because yes. if I have an inch and a half here, I want the cookies to be an inch and a half square. This so is where it gets tricksy. So what I'll do is I'll mark them at three-eighths and three-quarters. You know what? I think I'll go oh. this direction. What's the matter, Ray? I'm going to go this way. <laughs> His camera's having a day. Three-eighths, three-quarters, three-eighths, three-quarters. Three-eighths, three-quarters. Where am I here? One, two, three-eighths, three-quarters. Okay, I'll do the same thing down here. That'll ensure that I do get a straight cut. Yeah, th this is crucial because as you're making that cut, if you don't do it on both sides, it will end up being, a, for me, a disaster. Because you end up going... Yeah, you yeah. You end up having would... unparalleled lines. They uh, go off piste, as I say. So, Gazine, I'm going to cut all these, but I'll, I'm just I'm going to cut four of these and assemble them. Yeah. And then we can go back to you and I'll assemble the you second pair, the second four while you're doing things. And this strip here, that'll become more marbleized. Okay, so now <clears throat> I've scored them. Again, be really careful and keep a nice vertical knife. And make sure you, sure you know where your thumbs are while you do this. I mean, you could really make a beautiful stripey cookie, too, if you wanted to just cut those pieces. Sure. And so you're cutting four strips to assemble. That's right. That's right. Okay, so I'm gonna now assemble, and I'll come back to this, the rest of it. I but just want to take a to bite assemble out of that it. <laughs> it's really quite simple. Again, thin so that it becomes tacky quickly and becomes glue. And now I simply lay this one offset. So if it's chocolate blonde, chocolate blonde. Now I go blonde, chocolate blonde, chocolate. And then I go opposite. And then opposite. That's beautiful. So there's that. And now just a very light pinning. And while it's still cold, Cut it for the marble. Okay. At this point, 
these will be wrapped. I don't want to do the final cutting until this is totally cold. So you could make the dough today, tomorrow bring it to this phase, chill it for an hour and bake it, or tomorrow you could bring it to this phase and chill it for two or three days, and then cut it up. So if you're going to have a bunch of people over and you want to make a reasonably fancy cookie, you don't have to do it all the day they're coming over. You can get the work done in a slow procession. Okay, so there's our assembled. It's beautiful. You know, I would have a problem of not making them right away because I would go back to the refrigerator and take bites out of the <laughs> dough. I'm just going to give this just me. the marbleized. Oh, and, let's, and then, let's marbleize it. Back to you. Right? I guess so, those become sentient. Okay. <laughs> so here's the scraps. You don't want to knead it till it's the same color, obviously, or it won't look good. So just kind of mush it together and then roll it. I like to roll it so it's about the same dimension. Now, isn't that good timing? So it's about the same dimension as the log. Okay? How are we looking brown. in here? So I would say 12 minutes and they got a little brown. Okay, so here, how do you know when they're done? What I do is I like to, this I can tell just from the brown tinge yeah. on these, but generally what I do is I turn one upside down and I look, and you'll want to see some browning of the blonde dough. It's pretty hard to ascertain things from the chocolate dough, of course, but the, bra the blonde dough should start showing some color. So this is definitely done. Yeah. And look at those marbleized ones. All right. Those are special. And look here's at that. these. I love it. Okay. Back to you, Gazina. Gonna make some strudel. I mean, some strudel. <laughs> strudel will be something entirely different. Now that I have this assembled, it's been resting for about 20 minutes. You just want to give it some time to puff back up after you set in that fruit. I'm gonna make the strudel for on top. Now, this recipe is a part of the main recipe that I gave you to make the entire cake. However, you can make this and you can double, quadruple, however you like it, and use this streusel for pies, for muffins, whatever you like. So I will make a big batch. I will get to the stage where everything is combined and crumbly, and I'll put it in a big Ziploc bag and freeze it. And then you take out pieces as you need it. Just, you know, I sometimes bake it off on a sheet pan and put it on top of ice cream when you need it. The streusel is there. So in here I have a cup of all-purpose flour, a quarter cup of brown, and then a quarter cup of granulated sugar, and a pinch of salt. And I also added, and this is totally optional, it's really not a part of the, the regular recipe, a handful of slivered almonds, just for fun. And then over here I have melted, unsalted butter, seven tablespoons. And I'm going to add that all in. I have a little flour off to the side because sometimes you feel that you need to add a little more flour in to make sure that those crumbles really aren't too butterlogged, but this is actually looking great. So at this stage right here, where it's still a little floury, but you're seeing obvious chunks, I get in with my hands. I don't use my hands right away when I first put in the butter because then you would be wearing more of the streusel than you would be actually putting on your cake. You would just look like a monster. So at this point, I'm gonna use my hands and I'm going to pinch to combine some of that flour and to create those lovely crumbles. And I don't to toast those almonds ahead of time because I don't want them to get too brown in the oven because they'll get nice and toasty once they are baked in here. So this is going to bake at 350 and it bakes for about 30 to 40, 45 minutes. After I put on this lovely stuff and I, I use all of it, I go crazy. You don't have to, but what it does, because you don't have a very sweet bottom, you add some sweetness with 
the streusel, and it's lovely. So when my mom made this, she would make what's called a mürbeteig, which is like a sweet dough or a short dough, and that would bring all the sweetness you needed, so we often would not put any streusel on top. But in this case, it needs it because plums, you can see that these red plums are off, obviously nice and sweet, but the Italian plums often are very tart, but they have just a lovely flavor, and they do need that little bit of sweetness riding through them on top. So even, even. And then it will go into the oven, as I said, for about 30 to 40 minutes. What you're going to do is you're going to check for this to be brown along the sides. But I also, once in a while, do a quick check of the dough right in the middle, if you can. I've got asbestos fingers, so I can do that pretty easily. Just realize that you might think that 30 minutes isn't really a long time for a yeast to dough. This is rolled out so thinly that it will bake quickly. So just be on top of it. The other thing that I'll do too, because the dough is so thin on the sides and sometimes you have a bit exposed, I'm gonna grab the biggest aluminum foil in the history of aluminum foil. If you don't have one that's this wide, because this is kind of unusual, what you would do is you would take two pieces and overlap them. But I have found that this 18 inch wide one is perfect for my purposes. And what I will do is put this on top like so. And then I will create, so you know when you ha make a pie and the edge gets a little dark, too dark and you have that little protection for it. I start off with this protection going in and I leave it on the entire time. Just that much, barely. And it's still open so that that side bakes, but it's just a little bit of protection so that edge doesn't get super, super, super brown so that you get a consistency of texture throughout. And it's like framing the picture right there. It's like the Mona Lisa of plum cakes. So now it will go straight into the oven. It's protected on the edges, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and it'll be delicious. Traditionally, this is served with schlags on it, with uh, whipped cream. You can have it when it's warm out of the oven with ice cream as well. Prove it. That's usually what I do. <laughs> I usually don't wait that long to eat it. And what's interesting is that there, you might think, is there a big difference between the Italian plums and these plums? I think there is. Yeah. I think there is in texture and in taste, um, and also in aroma. Because whenever the Tzvechkin are baking, I start crying when mm. I smell them. So I will not be crying today. Not today. But when the Svetchen are ripe, they're, yeah. they're drier than when they, these plums are they ripe. They are drier. And that's what I was saying. When you do get, if you do use these kinds of plums, make sure that they feel firm. Yeah. Because otherwise, cutting them and pitting them. Way too much You juice. are going to be getting yeah. juice on yourself and no plums on here. So just make sure they feel plums. These apricots, they were very firm. Mm. Uh, and it made all that work very easy. But again, if you're using the Tzvechkin, what you do is that you take the plum in your hand and where you see that seam, yes. that's only where you cut. Mm -hmm. You don't go all the way around and then you part it and leave it hinged where it doesn't have a seam. Obviously take out the pit. At the very top where the little um, stem would be, you make two very small cuts at the top and then you lay them mm. sitting up and they sit upright, they don't lay back. They pretty much sit upright and then you, that's why you need so many plums because they're, they're standing up as opposed to laying down. And how do you, do you reheat it to eat it? If it's uh, two or three days old uh, or what do you do? You can, it's totally up to you. I've been known to eat it like cold pizza. Mm -hmm. What Just, about the difference between the hefeteig, the yeasted one and the myrbteig, unyeasted? Which one has a better keeping quality? Um, I would say they're pretty much equal based on how you treat the top of it. The myrbteig has so much sugar in it yeah. that it keeps pretty well. Like, and butter, like, it's got more and butter. And butter, it has more butter too. So it's almost like this, the sabla cookie you did. Mm -hmm. And then it has that kind of also sandiness. Yes, well sable it. means sandy. Yes, the hefeteig tends to dry out, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So. Putting a little apricot jam if you're not going to eat it all at once, 
is not a bad idea just to keep it nice and preserved. But I find that especially when now, if you are starting to entertain socially distanced, you can make a big uh, thing like this, cut it up while it's still hot, and have it on its separate place plates ready to go. Do you have to keep the plums six feet apart though? No, they, they have to be Only close the people, together. Just the people. Plums are always close together. The people have to be <laughs> distanced. So this way you can feed quite a few people without going back and forth yeah. for servings. You can just parse it out and the plums will tell you where to cut. That's right. They, it's, it's so tremens that way. It's say this is where you cut and no is. So this is going to go in the oven for those 30 to 40 minutes and the whole bakery is going to smell like juicy plums. Mm. And now, Jeffrey. Now it's time to mix dough. It is the dough mix. So, you okay, Ray? Please continue talking. Okay. Is the filming happening? I guess it is. I see myself over there. So... It always happens. The filming is always happening. This is, this is the vagaries of live. As always, <laughs> things are in a reverse chronology. So the last thing is the mixing of the dough. This is a pretty straightforward cookie dough that's, that uses the creaming method, which means cold butter and sugar and salt get creamed until they're reasonably smooth. I'll show you what that looks like when we get there. After that, the eggs go in. In this case, it's just yolks. There's no whole eggs. And finally, all the flour goes in at the end. So I made already yesterday the vanilla dough, the light dough, and now I'll make the cocoa dough so that I have, again, one of each, and I can do something with it when I get home. But what I love also about this recipe is that when you make the vanilla dough and the cocoa dough together, you make the vanilla first. Yes, I you, think I put that in the recipe, You did, right? and you yeah. scrape out all the vanilla dough, and then you don't have to re-clean the mixer. Right. You just use it as is when you do the cocoa dough. So a few things to look out for when you're doing the creaming method. The first would be you'll want to have cold butter. If I wound up with room temperature butter, let's see. Where can I plug this in, Gazina? Oh, I'll do that. That's my job. Sorry. I'm coming over. Okay, thanks. If I started with warm butter, there would be a distinct danger that the cookies would spread. They would have too much spread to them. So you want to start with cold butter when you cream. You're going to move it closer to me, and then I can... Oh, sorry. Go. Nope, got it. Got it? Okay. Yep. You'll want to cream on medium speed so that you process the sugar and butter reasonably quickly so, again, you're not warming up the ingredients. And it is easier to cream with European butter because it comes together more quickly than the American butter. It always tends seems more to, plastic it's than more European plastic. butter. It is more plastic, and it's, it's easier for cold creaming. Although that being said, there are some very good high butter fat American butters. Yes, absolutely. Now, which is great. So scrape this a couple times as needed. Depending on your mixer, you may or may not have a little film of butter and sugar that just stays on the bottom or on the side and never seems to get into the party. So if that's the case, scrape, scrape the hook if need be, the paddle I mean, and then continue. When I was learning how to do creaming method, it was with French pastry chefs in the 1970s. And what they would do is they would run some of the butter and sugar between their fingers to get a sense of the granular size of the sugar. They would want to not take it to the point where the sugar was completely dissolved, but take it so that the sugar was somewhat reduced in terms of particle size. And so I've always just stuck with that method. They knew what they were doing. Oh, see, this, I call this my illegal method because it never touches the bottom. I can still see some particles of pure butter, so I know that I have to keep creaming to get them incorporated. But it's, it's close now. 
But the difference between creaming for a cake and creaming for a cookie is different in that you don't need to get, you're not looking to aerate it as you would were a That's cake. right, that's right. So this is a, a little zippier. A lot zippier, Yes, it's a say. lot zippier. A lot zippier. And I'll give it another few seconds. There's still a few particles of butter that are a little bigger than I'd like. Now before, it, because I don't know that Ray can get in there with the camera troubles, before you add the egg, I, could you yeah, definitely. bring the bowl to camera? Yep. And I think we're about there now. Personally, I'd rather have a few little bits of unincorporated butter rather than 100% incorporation. Yes. Again, so, for the reason that I don't want to get this too warm. Yeah, that should be good. So you were feeling that they were they were smaller but yep. not disappeared. The sugar is more or less almost all dissolved. I can feel a little granulation. Okay, after this, in goes the yolks. So you can see that's not light and fluffy as you would have in a cake. How many yolks is that? This is two yolks and vanilla. And again, you'll do this on medium speed. with a couple of scrapes as needed. The other thing is that scraping is so essential and many home bakers don't know how often you really should be scraping. Which is a very good reason why when you're mixing any kind of dough, it doesn't matter how experienced you are, the best thing you can do is recognize that the entire universe exists right here. So I'm not thinking about what's for dinner, I'm not thinking about who I want to email later on. If I'm mixing this dough, that's the reality that I just want to put all my focus on. Again, illegal maneuver. Okay. I do this all the time. Just make sure when you lift the bowl like that, you, you continue holding onto the handle. This is what it looks like now. Pretty good even incorporation. There's no big signs of butter that didn't get joined up with the yolks and vice versa. So now all the flour goes in at once. And so the principle of this kind of mixing is the following. We cream it, we add the liquids. When the flour goes in, in this case, flour and cocoa, now we'll go to slow speed, and now we mix only to incorporation. Yeah. Um, there's not too much danger of gluten development because the flour is going to be surrounded by all the fat from the butter. Nevertheless, if we overdo this stage, we could get a tough cookie, mm -hmm. and we could get a cookie that spreads too much. Yes. So for the creaming method, proper technique would be now we go to a slow speed, mix it only until the flour is incorporated and we don't see any lumps. And we will definitely need a scrape down or two at this phase as well. You know what I do? I usually have double uh, plastic wrap, and at that second, even if I see a tiny bit of flour riding the top, I'll put it out onto my plastic wrap and almost fraisage it. I will uh -huh. smush it that way hand, yeah. so that I can see it rather than over mixing it in the mixer. Yep, yep. So first it looks a bit crumbly. Also, PSA, stop at home, stop your mixer when you do that. 
This would be a good time. I don't know if you can see that, Ray. Can you see it in there? Yeah. You might, you might have to this would be too. a good time for scraping, right? Because all this stuff around the perimeter hasn't had any action. And so I want to. Sure. Look, it is crumbly, you and you can see that little bit of move the move the paddle here. Yeah, right there. Okay. Go all the way down to the hump in the bottom of the bowl. Yes. Get everything freed up. That and nubbin. And continue. <laughs> the problem is when the camera becomes sentient, <laughs> it does whatever it wants. And again, low. Yep. The whole time is low. All up. As soon as there's no more bits of flour, we're done. And that is just about now. So, Do you need more plastic wrap than that? No, I saved one of the ones that I, when I unwrapped the cookies before, so I'll use that again. This dough should feel tacky but not sticky. That's another sign to look for when you're done mixing it. Does it still feel cool? It's still very yes. cool, yeah. That's the other thing. And I'll put it on the plastic and then I'll show you what I mean by tacky, not sticky. Okay, so when I press into it, it's not sticking to my fingers. It's not dry and crumbly, but neither is it sticky. And that's, that's the consistency of the finished dough. So again, you'll start by making the blonde one so that you don't have to worry about washing your bowl, and then right away mix the chocolate one. When you fashion it into a rough rectangle. You don't want to refrigerate it that way. You want to make it an even rectangle. If it's all wobbly like this, you're going to have problems. So loosely, very loosely, put on the plastic wrap and then now there's room for this to move because I didn't do it tightly. Yeah. Right? Now Several weeks ago, you were doing this with when you made the Anversé puff pastry, yeah. and you were very precise about getting really beautiful right angles right. on your butter. That's yeah. a different application. Here, it's not quite so important that it's a perfect rectangle because some scrap is inevitable and some scrap is desirable. However, you want to make sure that you have a decent depth Right, so yep. that when you do roll it out, that it isn't that it's not right um, that it's thinner not than three eighths of an inch. That's right. So here we are. That'll go to bed like this, and again, this can get processed over the next four or five days. Beautiful. Good. We've had cookies. We've had kuchen that's yeasted. Next week is yeah. going to be our last show. Right. So <laughs> it's like we're on a You didn't coaster. warn people. We didn't warn you. But next week yep. is our last show. What are you making next week? Week 12. How about that? It's been three months, Kazina. I know. About that? Next week it's I'm going to make traditional pretzels, German-style pretzels. I'm going to dip them in a lye bath. We're going to talk about all the precautions and dangers of lye. And, and the alternatives. And the alternatives, too, if there are any. But if there are any. Yeah. There is one yeah. that makes... Yeah. The, we'll talk about we'll talk why about that makes all. us unhappy. Yeah. But it is safer. And what are you doing next week? I'm doing a pavlova. So I want to do something that really showcased summer coming up. Mm -hmm. And it could also translate to your 4th of July plans. Because Will you give a description of it, please? I think when I say I'm making pretzels, people know what I'm talking about. Well, a pavlova is a meringue-based cake that has cream on top and berries. There is a recipe on King Arthur, and it's done in the American way where it's very flat. I like to do it like a kiwi does it. 
I like to make it tall and like a tutu. That's how I've seen it. Because a lot, Americans often flatten it out so yeah. that there's more surface area to put the filling mm -hmm. on. But I make it look like the ballerina mm -hmm. Pavlova's tutu. So it's nice and tall. It's crisp on the outside, but you have more of that lovely marshmallowy yeah. inside. Yeah. And I think the elegance is there for the taller versions. Huh. Do you have enough whites? Because I've got plenty of whites I at have home from having made these. You so have a lot many of whites. whites. Okay, good. I have so many whites. So, yeah, so next week is week 12, and it will be the last one. So last it's going to be a little bittersweet. It will. But thank you so much for spending mm, time with us. Really. It was a joy, as always. As thank always. you, Jeffrey. We'll yeah. be back on our normal sides Bake next time. Bake well. Bake well. Be safe. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.